welcome to Firebase release notes for April, where we'll be looking at some big and small releases from Firebase for the past month or so. We have six topics today, so let's dig in right away. Many apps show their users a list of results from the database. And if your database contains more results than your users are likely to look at straight away, you can improve performance and reduce costs by only loading a subset of the results initially, and then loading the rest on demand. Now, if you've ever implemented this on the real-time database, you know that it's based around knowing the first or the last node that is shown on a page. Well, we've just added new start after and end before APIs that mean that you no longer have to load an overlapping item. This saves some bandwidth and it typically makes your code easier to read. We're really happy that we've been able to bring this API from Firestore to the real-time database. See the links in the description below for the relevant SDK releases. And speaking of the real-time database, for quite some time now, you've been able to manage the security rules for your database through the get rules and set rules methods in our admin SDKs. But now, if you call such methods when you've enabled the emulator, the admin SDK automatically connects to the local emulator and it reads or updates the rules right there. This is yet another step towards making local first development easier with the emulator suite. In BOM version 26.8 of the Crashlytics Android SDK, we fixed an uncaught exception that could be thrown if Crashlytics was unable to collect battery state information. Now, if this process fails, Crashlytics will report default values for the battery state rather than not reporting anything at all. This means that you should see more crashes being reported if your user's apps crash in this state. See the link to the GitHub issue in the description below for full information. You can now manage Firebase hosting sites through a REST API and through the Firebase CLI. With these, you can create, list, delete, and retrieve information about all of your hosting sites for your Firebase project. We also added support for multiple accounts to the CLI. If you frequently need to use multiple Google accounts with the CLI, for example, maybe one for your work projects and one for your personal projects, you had to run Firebase logout and then Firebase login to change the global login every time. This is a slow task and it cannot be automated because it requires that you give consent in a browser pop-up. With the new login add command, you can now add users once, and then you switch between them using the new login use command that you can see here. I love seeing time-saving features like this being added. If you use this or any of the other new features, let me know what you think about them in the comments below. Firebase in-app messaging helps you deeply engage your active users by showing them targeted and contextual messages that nudge them to complete certain in-app actions. In version 7.9 of our iOS SDKs, we introduced a new SwiftUI-friendly API for screen tracking and for building custom in-app messages. This means that you can now use SwiftUI to more easily build more native experience for displaying in-app messages on iOS. We also added community support for watchOS to the real-time database and we added the remote config watchOS build to Swift Package Manager. We'll keep expanding to more Apple platforms for more Firebase products, so keep checking those release notes for updates. And finally, from May 18 to May 20, we're hosting Google I.O. right here where you're watching me now. At I.O., we have many more announcements from the Firebase team and from all the other teams at Google. And attending I.O. is completely free this year. So join us for three full days of geeking out together. That's all we have for today. My name is Frank Ruppuff, and I'll see you on a future episode of Firebase Release Notes.